For a long time now, I've been fascinated with behavior change. And everybody has some type of behavior change they want to make. Whether it's to lose weight, quit smoking, or procrastinate less, we're all obsessed with trying to get our behaviors under control. How about you? Have you ever tried to change your behavior before? I see some nods, I see some hand raises. It's hard, right? Really, really hard, I should know. For the past two years, I've been trying to eat healthier. And it's so difficult. I can get it right for a little bit where I'm eating salad and having lots of fish and all the stuff I'm supposed to eat. But the thought of giving up pizza and ice cream and all the things I love is just not going to happen. <laughs> and apparently, I'm not alone. I was uh, looking online trying to find some statistics on healthy eating. And um, the most optimistic one I found was, according to the National Registry of Weight Loss, only about 20% of people who are overweight actually meet their weight loss goal. It's really difficult, no matter how much you want something, to actually change what we're doing. So you're probably wondering right now, why am I kicking off a talk on organizational management talking about my eating behavior? Well, the thing is, one of the largest challenges that organizations face in the 21st century is getting their employees to change behavior. And if you think it's difficult to reach your own goals, imagine what it's like to get 500 or 5,000 or 500,000 people to change their behavior all at the same time. It's borderline impossible. For the past five years, my business, Cindio Social, has doubled in size year over year because organizations ranging from elementary schools to governments and everything in between are struggling with this massive problem with change. So why is behavior change at the employee level so important for organizations? Uh, I'll start with a story from one of my all-time favorite companies, Blockbuster Video. I hear some laughs. You probably remember Blockbuster Video. I used to love going there to rent movies, and they, they would rent VHSs and DVDs and anything you want to see you could get there. And um, Blockbuster was massive. There was one on practically every street corner. At the height of its success in the mid-90s, there was 60,000 Blockbuster employees, and there were 9,000 uh, 9, Blockbuster stores in the US. If you want to rent a movie, chances are you went to Blockbuster. But in uh, 1998, Netflix came on the scene. And with Netflix came the rise of video streaming, direct mail DVDs, and binge watching our favorite television shows. Needless to say, Blockbuster's leadership was caught off guard. They were forced to shift objectives, change priorities, and figure out how to try and keep up. By 2011, the amount of change was too great, and Blockbuster only had 1,700 stores left. Today, Blockbuster as a company no longer exists. Now, hindsight's obviously 2020, and Blockbuster was blindsided by technological innovation. But even so, they had 60,000 people to throw at the problem of figuring out how to stay modern. They had virtually unlimited money to play with. They had the brand name in renting videos and millions of paying customers. Blockbuster even had the opportunity to purchase Netflix in the year 2000 for $50 million, their biggest competitor. So how is it that a company that's one of the largest in the US and most successful in its industry go from being a giant and then not exist anymore? Well, the reason why is from the C-suite all the way down to the lowest paid worker, the amount of change that each employee had to do was just too great. Employees had to create new products, learn how to sell them, collaborate together differently, and work harder than ever before. It was the equivalent to getting 60,000 people to quit smoking, lose 20 pounds, and learn a foreign language all at the same time. So when you think about companies like Blockbuster or Netflix or other types of organizations, what types of change are their employees required to make? From the work that we've done, we found that change takes three forms. Adopting new tools, shifting strategic focus, and uh, incorporating high performance behaviors into the employees' everyday lives. Adopting new tools can be as simple as going from pencil and paper to laptops to mobile phones. Not everybody loves the latest and greatest technology. Some people, they push back pretty hard. It costs a lot of time and money to transition. Shifting strategic focus would be when a company like CVS starts out as being a pharmacy and then becomes a grocery store slash convenience store chain, but then goes back to healthcare again. If you've been a CVS employee for 20 years, you're constantly changing your idea of how your work connects to what the company does. An example of a high performance habit would be when a company like Yahoo decides they want employees to collaborate together more face to face. So they get rid of their famous work from home policy. If you were a Yahoo employee, overnight you have to change your work life balance. Now, unfortunately for managers everywhere, all of these types of changes are incredibly hard to get stick. According to some of the top consulting firms in the world, 75% of all organizational change fails or fails to meet expectations. Think about that for a second. 75% of all organizational change fails or fails to meet expectations. That's not some of the time, that's most of the time. And that's really scary, obviously, if you, know, you have a $6 million software rollout and you're the person in charge of it because you could lose your job. But imagine how terrifying that is in an ultra-high pressure organization like a hospital or the military, where it's not just time and money that's on the line, it's potentially people's lives. The other day I was 
hang out with my friend, his name's Mert, he's the CEO of SwipeSense, a company that helps doctors and nurses wash their hands more effectively. And he told me an alarming statistic about infections in hospital. In the United States alone, there are two million infections every year, leading to 100,000 deaths. According to the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, 20 to 70% of all those infections could be eliminated if doctors and nurses wash their hands better. Hand washing, really simple, right? It takes 30 seconds. If you've ever been to a hospital before, there's sanitizer in virtually every room. Even so, it's one of the biggest challenges that hospitals face is reducing the amount of infections they have. So why is it that large organizations have such a hard time getting their smartest employees, I mean, we're talking about doctors and nurses here, to adopt very small changes that have huge upside? The reason why is because organizations ignore the critical relationships and social factors that help or hinder change. Remember how I wanted to eat better? Well, if my friends don't have to lose weight and they love to go out to good restaurants and we all go out and get pizza, it's gonna be really hard for me to stick with my new habit. And it's the same thing inside large organizations where when you roll to change, not everybody has to change at the same rate. There isn't always the same imperative or some people are actually downright resistant to change. Most organizations, they spend so much time and money and energy on targeting individuals and convincing them why is a change important for you and why is it gonna impact you? But they ignore those key relationships. Now, luckily for us though, the solution to this lies in something that we're all becoming increasingly more familiar with, social influence and peer effects. And I stumbled upon this answer actually not working uh, with organizations but working in music. I was a manager for pop and hip hop groups. And um, we were trying to figure out how do we get more listeners for our fans. This is in the early days of like MySpace and when Facebook was just coming out. And uh, I stumbled upon network analysis. And network analysis is about mapping and measuring how humans interact. And people, they always ask me when I tell them I work in social networks, like, oh, you work for Facebook and, and Twitter. And it, it, no, it actually goes far beyond this. It's really about the math and theory and science behind how people create, manage, and dissolve relationships. And one of the most powerful areas within network analysis is understanding influence. And when most people think of influence or influencers, we think about the Katy Perrys and the Kanye West of the world. The folks who have massive Twitter followers and ways that they can broadcast and start trends and, and change culture. But the most powerful influencers and the most exciting ones are the ones actually in our everyday lives. Take a second, think about the people who introduce you to new things. The folks who happen to hear about every YouTube video or meme before anybody else does. The people who you go to for advice about your career or, or what to wear or different things like that. There's always different types of influencers around us. And with network analysis, you can actually map and measure and quantify those different types of influence and find those people. So naturally, we became obsessed with this. We finally found a way to make all the artists we worked with famous. And instead of taking the traditional approach to music, where you have a whole bunch of fans and you target everybody equally, whether it's through concerts or advertising or things like that, we thought, what if we can find a couple of people who are already those influencers, who are already trendsetters plugged into the latest music and who people already go to to find out what's, what, what's hot. So we found these people. Asked around, we, we kind of eyeballed it and asked our friends, you know, who are the folks who you'd go to at different schools? And we shared our music with them and said, what do you think? And we showed them all the different artists we're working with, which ones are your favorites, would you share it with your friends? And they did, as they would normally do if they discovered any other music. And then they shared it with their friends. And they shared it with their friends, until ultimately we hit tens of thousands of listeners by only starting with about 15 people. To this day, some of the artists we worked with, like Mike Posner and Big Sean, are internationally touring artists. The same technique is helping some of the largest organizations in the world tackle change. Instead of finding influencers who are trendsetters for music, they're finding people who are, who are influential but particularly amenable to the types of changes that organizations are trying to roll out, whether it's the folks who love to use new technology when they're rolling out a new, um, a new phone or an iPad system or something like that. Additionally, large organizations are sitting on a massive amount of data that allow us to figure out exactly which influencers to start with for a particular initiative. Of course, in our own lives, we can eyeball who are the key people who help us out or who can spread information. But if you have hundreds of people, or thousands or tens of thousands, it's impossible to find all the right folks. Luckily, though, in large organizations, you have email networks, who email to, um, social media internally, like Yammer and Jive and things like that, and uh, even chat data to help pinpoint which relationships are the ones that are really key for sharing information, and using that to systematically find these people. You can even survey and ask folks who are the people who you would like to go to to learn about new changes and be able to, to um, improve your job uh, on the go. 
companies that are doing this are going beyond just finding influencers. They're finding the right influencer in the right department with the right skill set to track particular changes. It's a massive paradigm shift for organizations. Organizations that are doing this are moving beyond intuition and guessing around change and actually applying analytics and systematic processes. Early adopters of an influencer approach for change have two key benefits. The first is they're always ready for change. Whether it is that tool adoption or shifting strategic alignment, change is continuous and simultaneous. It's never just one and done. So knowing who the key people are allows organizations to be ready. And instead of waiting for six months and going back, they always know who to go to. Second, and even more powerful, is these organizations are finding changes they never even knew, to ha never even knew they had to make. By being plugged into the people who are already on the ground working as hard as they can and, and, and doing the real work, they are finding incredible innovation. To give you an example of this, in 2008, the US Army experienced an increase in fatalities from improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the time, my good friend Dave Gatellius was working with the US Army and DARPA to map and measure networks of soldiers working on an online platform to share best practices on how to diffuse, identify, and avoid improvised explosive devices in the field. What they found was really powerful. There was one soldier in particular who had these best practices that were saving lives on the battlefield, but only a small fraction of soldiers who were actually going and diffusing bombs ever heard about them. And they found this by looking at who this person was communicating with. They actually analyzed some of the text on the, uh, on the platform. And most organizations would just kind of let it be. But the US Army, they actually built a center of excellence around this expert, around other influencers as well, who were plugged into how, uh, how best practices could, could change the work that they're doing. And they actually took a grassroots approach to change. It's really powerful because most organizations that are top down, they expect to have change come from the CEO or leaders. But in this case, it was coming from the bottom up. And beyond the Army, organizations as diverse as Procter & Gamble and Salesforce.com are approaching this, are, uh, are applying influencers to a whole bunch of problems, including change. And these organizations, they have employees who are more empowered, who better understand how change impacts them, and who feel more aligned to the overall objectives of their organization. Even so, today, only a fraction of the world's organizations use influencers and an influencer approach to change. Most still set a change up, target people individually, and wait for six months, and it doesn't work out. Ironically, it seems, organizations are slow to change how they manage change. <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> 10 years ago, this made sense. The technology for mapping influencers and, and, and identifying these folks, it was at, it was still in its infant stages. Today, and, and, I, and, and still, people didn't even know what social media was or, or think of themselves as part of a social network before. Today, it's different. Every organization is clamoring to figure out how can we use social to better engage customers and employees. They're spending millions of dollars to figure out how can we mine our data for additional value and to streamline our businesses. And they're setting up platforms to connect the right people to the right information at the right time. Mapping influencers and connecting them to change initiatives is at the crossroads of these powerful trends. 10 years from now, every organization in the world will use an influencer approach to change. This is not a popularity contest. Knowing who the information spreaders, role models, and change agents are will be the difference between organizations thriving and innovating or being beaten to the ground like Blockbuster. So in a world where organizations value influence and connectedness so much, what does that leave us as individuals and me and my pursuit of healthy eating? Just as it's critical for organizations to know who the key people are, it's so valuable for us to understand the influencers in our own lives. Take a second. Think about the people who influence you, who are either helping you be the best possible person you can be or holding you back from some of your greatest goals. Then flip that around. Think about who are the people who you in turn influence. Through our relationships with others, we're 10 times or 100 times more powerful than we ever are on our own. By understanding this large shared network that we're all a part of, we can achieve our biggest goals, whether together in organizations or our own personal aspirations.